Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to um, the illustration history class. And the class today is going to feature Terry Brown. Brent Watkinson is also here, uh, myself, and uh, Scott is here to assist us. I know there'll be others uh, dropping in off and on throughout the uh, throughout the class. And today, I think you're going to be absolutely overwhelmed by um, a lot of images, a lot of imagery you haven't seen before. Some you have. Great explanation of of a, of a lot of in, a lot of imagery. Uh, I'm going to start out by uh, giving a little bit of background with Terry. Uh, I met Terry when I was a teenager um, at, at the Society of Illustrators, and he he wasn't. He was a teenager almost too. Uh, he wasn't much older than I was. Uh, he was working there. Um, the um, the last 25 years, Terry Brown, uh, he's now left the Society of Illustrators. He's uh, working with the Norman Rockwell Museum, um, and he's helping. He's going to help Tad um, and with the historical parts of what we're doing. And for 25 years, he was the curator of basically of a contemporary American illustration. And he has, it's a really interesting perspective when you listen to him talk, because he has a relationship with so many of these artists that he's talking about. Uh, for eight years, he's come to the academy and given a talk, um, uh, a, a lecture uh, similar to what you're going to get today. Uh, I'm sure it's slightly different. Uh, he always changes things up, but uh, his understanding of how the reason illustration is there, the function of it, um, why it started, why it changed, uh, the progression, the natural progression of it, uh, is really, really inspiring to listen to him talk. Well, John, thank you very much. Uh, I trust my voice is coming through to some. Um, yes, you do have a, a handout. I like to call it a cheat sheet. It's sort of the scenario of this movie. Uh, give you a chance to look at some of the names. This, by the way, is a big survey. Fast and curious. I'm not intending to get into depth into any any aspect. If you sign up for TAD and you take the full history course, we'll take apart every picture. There'll be much more time to look at individual images. So before I really get started on the on the history part of this thing, um, think about why history? Why do we study history at all? Why do we study art history? I'd like to think in the commercial realm, the applied art realm, we study history because there are always, have been, are now, and will be changes in mores. What can we get away with? Changes in styles. What is the what's the world buying today? And boy, does that swing back and forth. There are technical changes. We can do with an iPhone what took cadmium red and, and linseed oil 150 years ago. Staying on top of those things is really, really important. And the artist lives. I hope that you will enjoy some of these lives and maybe want to delve into them later. These are some just tidbits of what artists have said about what it is they do. George Chardella does these wonderful pen and ink and watercolor of musicians. He said one day at the bar at the Society, you know, this is a crazy business. So Tuesday, I get a call from Entertainment Weekly. We want you to go to this show over on the west side of Manhattan on Wednesday and do some drawings of T-Bone Walker. They give me the ticket. I go to the show. Thursday morning, I do a sketch. Thursday afternoon, the art director approves the sketch. Thursday night I do the finish. Friday I turn it in. It appears on Monday and 2.3 million people see my drawing with the tagline, illustration by Joe Chardello. Everyone said, that's great. Joe said, I would do this for free. Part of the jazz that some of these artists have is that knowing how far their images reach. Okay, I think of illustration also as having a an economic side to it, and don't you know that this artist got himself in a little bit of trouble? And you know what? Down the road, he, he didn't get into trouble because he, the Shepherd used a, a photograph. Well, that that sort of brought it to the to the fray. No, this guy's going to go down because he lied to the feds. Gang, whatever you do, you can't lie to the feds. We all remember the New Yorker cover that was that was created on a uh, on an iPhone. Wow, what kind of new technology is? 
is going to be coming up next where we can create images so on the fly. New Yorker got so much press out of this. And then there's the book, The Illustrator's 50. I'd like to read you a quote, if I will, about the Illustrator's Annual. Now, I'm not there anymore, so I don't have to promote this book. But this is a, a man named Tom Wolfe. The artist Tom Wolfe wrote Man in Full, Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, Bonfire of the Vanity. He's a pretty good interpreter of 20th and 21st century um, popular culture. For years now, Tom Wolf writes, I have felt that the annual published by the Society of Illustrators has been better than all of the catalogs of the contemporary art shows in New York put together. I feel very comfortable predicting that art historians, 50 years from now, assuming we are in a world kind enough to indulge art historians, will look back upon the illustrators as the great American artists of the second half of the 20th century. Well, I, of course, agree with him. I'm sure everyone in this choir agrees with him. Uh, nice to have someone as important as Tom Wolfe say that about this profession. This is the great Winslow Homer. The American Civil War was fought from the northern areas of Virginia through North Carolina down through Tennessee into the lower Mississippi Valley. You didn't really have to leave New York to get a good idea of what was going on, and many of these artist reporters uh, did not. Winslow Homer admitted to spending some three months up front. Really, he was more sketching and drawing uniforms and, and what the images on the hats looked like. This was just a, a study he did of a soldier studying a gravestone. Uh, but this is the kind of sketches that he did and sent back to the newspapers to be reproduced, showing what the, what the physical battles might actually have looked like um, the people had no idea what the terrain was like, what the, what the terror might have been, what the carnage might have been. And many of the artist reporters did not dwell on that as we potentially do today. And interestingly enough, after the war, Winslow Homer actually took many of those images and turned them into oil paintings. So this is an oil based on that original sketch. After the war, many of his original oils were turned into wood engravings for Harpers. And of course, we know him for his marvelous seascapes of, uh, of Americas, down from the, the Caribbean all the way up to Maine. Winslow Homer could arguably be said to be the greatest American painter of the, of the 19th century. Uh, he put the mark on the world for American painters. But do know that he, he, he cut his teeth during the American Civil War, uh, as did Thomas Nast. Now, we should be getting now into the era of, far and away, my favorite artist. Uh, it's a name we bandy about quite a bit. Uh, he's known as the father of American illustration, not because he was the greatest artist, but he had another aspect to his career that was really seminal as a teacher. Uh, he was a, an educated gentleman in engineering. He was a, a Quaker. You don't know much about the Quaker religion. It relies heavily on hard work, abstinence in, the, in special fuels, um, great amount of time spent in, in worship and contemplation, uh, but the hard work pays off. The man's name is Howard Pyle, of course. Howard Pyle's first illustration, and I just can't tell you how much of Howard Pyle's techniques and, and, and stuff is in this very first. Large objects in the foreground to bring the viewer in. People silhouetted in, in hallways constantly long involved uh, stretches of street and landscape to bring you back and forth within your picture. How often did he put the, the audience back to us? He loved to do that so that you were taken into the image. Look at all the layering between the last hat and his front leg and his back leg and this guy's front leg and his back leg and then the hand and then the, the door frame. This is all very intentional. Layers of a stage was the way he looked at every illustration. I can't harp on pile enough and take enough time to, to maul the bad guy, but he was, he was so good at, at seeing the world as a stage. I love this one. Look at this, look at this guy. Don't look at us. I'm pointing to where I want you to look. It's over here, the Battle of Bunker Hill happening on the other side. This is all very intentional staging. The kind of composition you get laughed at at most composition classes, Howard Pyle made a living at it, and dad it if it didn't work. 
Not much is actually known about his working technique, but in one of his books, he, we have this sketch. This is his ideation. This is all Howard Pyle had to put down between his mind, his eye, his hand, and his pencil in order for himself to know that the final composition would be this and flop. All I have to do is this, and I know I've got it to be able to paint this. That's incredible. That's how it piled. Well, as I said, Al Parker in the late 50s started to develop the more uh, expressionistic look of his work in the era known as boy-girl illustration. That is, the girl is the most important part. The guy is just there because we've got to make this straight. For the women's publications that were Ladies' Home Journal, Red Book, Women's Day, McCall's, they were known as the uh, Seven Sisters. And that was great media for illustrators because the art directors were strong. They said, we're going to give you a, a full spread of work. You know, John and Kobe Whitmore, they would get these large pieces of paper to, to fill in with great art and a little bit of text, too. This is the kind of media that made superstars in the illustration world out of this group. And again, at the same time, there's another group that's not happy with this going on because they would like to be doing that, but their work is not uh, in that same representational kind of look. It's really about being, being good to people along, on the way up. And uh, I think I have over the years. And look at the kind of people I had to follow up. The, you know, I had Bob Peek. I had Bernie. And Harold von Schmidt, I didn't even mention Harold von Schmidt. That was one of the, one of the great stars. Um, hey, I, I saw Meet Schaefer take his last breath. How cool was that? So, I mean, I'll, I'll shut up. You guys have had your, had your ear full, but um, anyway. Well, Terry, you're, you're, um, you're welcome to retire to your whiskey and your chair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I just might. <laughs> um, yeah, thank Thanks, you, uh, everybody. That was great. Um, Terry, I know I know you're you're probably in a little bit of pain, so uh, uh, get out of here. And I can't thank you enough, and you, you've made everybody very ha happy, myself included.